So today we're going to talk about uh, monitoring your patients under anesthesia. And we're also going to talk about our heart rates and calculating heart rate and looking at ECGs. So we're going to get started. So this is what our patients should look like under anesthesia uh, when we're actually monitoring them correctly. So we have all of our leads on our patients, our blood pressure cuff. Um, if we have a Doppler on them with a capnograph, pulse ox, everything is hooked up to our patient. We're actually looking at our patient throughout anesthesia. We have an esophageal stethoscope on them, um, which is really, really nice because obviously when our patient is under anesthesia and if they're in surgery and everything, it's going to be really hard to be able to have a stethoscope on them. Um, during that time, um, our stethoscope is going to kind of be in the way of our surgeon who's actually working on them. So it's really nice to be able to have an esophageal stethoscope um, so that we don't get in the way under our drapes and, and all of that. So um, it's important that we have a monitoring device to be actually able to, to listen to the heart. Um, and best practice is to have a device where we actually can hear the heart rather than um, just relying on uh, machines. And as you know, we could just have our ECG leads on a table at times and it will read a false um, signal saying that there's a heart rate. So we can't always rely just on machines. Um, so it's key to uh, us to uh, recognize what, you know, too light of anesthesia looks like and, and what's too deep. So obviously if our patient is too light, they can have um, pain perception, they can also be aroused. So, um, you know, I've had it where animals um, are, are jumping off of a table being too light. Um, and then I've had it where patients being too deep, they are slow to recovery, they can have anesthetic overdose and die. Um, we've had it where uh, I was just starting um, and at a, uh, a vet tech um, college and our anesthetic machine um, there's teaching a surgery. Obviously, um, I did not know this nor anyone else, but um, if you um, have it where your vaporizer is not being refilled appropriately, so your vaporizer goes below half, um, the wick of the vaporizer can dry out, obviously. And so um, I wasn't there previously. And so when I came in, um, you know, no one had monitored the vaporizer. And so we were monitoring under anesthesia and it was really weird that patients were waking up um, and granted, you know, um, our doctor's getting mad at us for that. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Like I know how to monitor animals under anesthesia. I don't know why they keep waking up. Um, and so we called in um, them to look at the vaporizer and when they looked at it, um, they were calibrating it and it was calibrating where um, our isoflurane at 5%, um, isoflurane, it was only reading at barely 1%. So that's why our patients were waking up. So that is also really important too, is that, you know, we're taking care of our vaporizers appropriately, and then we um, can keep our animals under anesthesia appropriately as well. So, um, but it is key to monitor our patients um, you know, consistently over time, um, we need to be looking at them constantly um, and then also recording them every five minutes. Um, and it's really important that we believe our CBT and not always necessarily the machine. Um, so what do we monitor? So here's just a list of the things that we monitor on our patients. So the respiratory rate, the depth, um, you know, their respiratory quality as well, um, their mucous membrane color, CRT, their heart rate, pulse quality, ECG, um, and their pulse strength, jaw tone, of course, so uh, how relaxed they are, that kind of thing. Eye position is really important. Um, and then also, um, you know, oxygen flow rate, um, IV catheter, if it's still patent or not. Um, I've had it where we've had to replace an IV catheter in the middle of surgery. Um, their temperature is also really important, their ETCO2 um, and what that is, the SpO2 and their blood pressure. So what does that look like? 
so just like we were talking about before, this is what it looks like on our patient. And so we're going to talk um, about our cardiac system first. So um, we always want to ascult our heart. And um, what does that look like, obviously, under anesthesia? So our heart is going to obviously look a, a lot different under anesthesia. Um, and so for dogs, it's going to vary, obviously, a little bit. Our, our larger dogs are going to have um, a lower heart rate um, than our, our the smaller dogs. Um, so typically we want to see that our heart rate in our, our larger dogs doesn't go below 60. Um, and our smaller dogs, obviously same thing, but we're probably going to see a little bit higher heart rate in our smaller dogs. Um, you may see that in some more active dogs, um, their heart rate can go below 60. So keep that in mind. So like your sport sporting breed dogs, um, like border collies who are really active, um, you can see their heart rates go, you know, in the 50s, sometimes even in the 40s, um, which can really kind of alarm some um, newer technicians and even some seasoned technicians sometimes. And it also really depends on what drugs we give to. So we have to keep that in mind, you know, like dexmedetomidine is, um, and even xylazine, um, are notorious for alerting us. So we have to keep that in mind too. And that's when we talk about like cardiac function and cardiac output, um, that heart rate doesn't just uh, equal heart rate. Um, so we have to also think about stroke volume in their case and like blood pressure as well. Like, is our blood pressure normal? Um, and if so, let's, let's keep an eye out on our blood pressure. And so if anything changes in our blood pressure, then we can think about, all right, um, let's maybe reverse our um, dexmedetomidine or xylazine or whatever. Um, and if that doesn't work, we can always, you know, go to bolusing fluids or um, because they could be, you know, um, hypovolemic or, you know, obviously turning down our anesthetic guests um, as well. Um, we don't necessarily have to just go straight to anticholinergics um, right away. That's actually kind of contraindicated in, in that sense, if, especially if they're getting enough of two. Um, and we can do quite a bit of other things. Same thing for any type of vasopressin. Um, granted, you think about doing a vasopressin in this case, but it's really a lot of times drug induced. And there's so many other things that we can try um, first before just going straight to a vasopressin, because once they start waking up, that vasopressin is still kind of kicking in and we're gonna end up going the other direction. So we don't wanna necessarily do that. Um, cats on here, um, they have in, I think McKiernan's, uh, that cat's heart rate can go to about 100. Um, and for me, that's a little bit of an alert, I guess. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, granted, that's, could it be the more drug-induced, but um, I'm thinking around the 120s is, is more in my comfort zone. So um, that's why I had 100 on here. It's more just to kind of be um, on the McKiernan's aspect to keep everything uh, cons consistent. So, um, so monitoring heart rate for me, I, I truly, um, use multiple things. And, and the reason for that is because if you're just using your ECG, um, a lot of times with the ECG, especially in cats, it double counts at times. So you'll see this and you, you might have experience with it too. If you have a cat, sometimes they have a little bit higher T waves, um, and so it'll double count those beats. Um, and so that obviously is gonna throw you off quite a bit. Um, so it's really good to have a way of monitoring the heart rate with another device. So depending on what you're doing, so if you just have a sedated animal, say you're doing a laceration repair, you might not need to necessarily use an esophageal stethoscope. Um, you can just use your regular stethoscope, which is great. If you're doing um, an abdominal procedure where you're not gonna be able to get your stethoscope under um, your drape because ideally your drape should be completely over your patient, right? Because we, we want to make sure that um, any dirty surface of your patient is covered. So we cannot, um, we can't bathe an animal always right before our procedure, right? And, and so typically with human patients, you know, they take a shower the night before with 
a chlorhexidine solution. And chlorhexidine keeps your skin clean for about two days. So they make you bathe in this chlorhexidine solution. Um, and so you're essentially clean. And they still drape you pretty much all the way as well. So um, if we're creating this tiny drape for just that little area, um, and this animal's like in a cage or at home, we can't say that the patient is completely clean. So we shouldn't have to put our stethoscope underneath that patient, you know, like it's very difficult. So having that esophageal stethoscope is really nice because we can place that in the patient and then just be able to listen and you can hear the heart really well usually. So um, that's really nice. Um, Another way of monitoring ECG too, and this is really nice, especially if you have hospitalized patients, is using a Holter monitor. So this um, has been really great. Like say you're monitoring a patient after a splenectomy or after a GDD, um, placing these so you don't have those clips on their legs after a long period of time, um, they hurt. And I know this because I did not personally do this, um, but I had a friend um, who worked in the ER ICU who um, she was a bit of a daredevil, um, but she actually placed these clips on her to see how much it hurt. She actually couldn't keep it on her body for more than a few seconds. Um, the alligator clips, she said, they are were incredibly painful. Um, and so just thinking about having those on your patient who's recovering from surgery and stuff, um, they can be really ouchy. So having these um, uh, tags that are on them, um, and just keeping them on. And what we would do with the halter monitor is that they have that stretch um, t-shirt like material and we would just put that on all of our patients. So we actually would have probably about 13 to 15 of these halter monitors um, for our patients in the ICU. And we were able to um, display them on uh, like a big screen TV for all of us to be able to watch all of the ECGs on, a, on one TV. So it was really, really cool. Um, and then the the bad part is, is that they run off of batteries. So we would have to have a, a ton of different batteries um, so that we could run these. So what we ended up doing, which is kind of a pain, is that when we weren't running them, we would take the batteries out um, to preserve batteries for as long as possible. So it's kind of dumb, but um, that way it did Kind of preserve everything but they were really nice so that animals didn't have to have the alligator clips on them for a long period of time and we could see it all on one screen um also the nice thing is that it recorded it on the tv so that if there was something that we were questioning and our cardiologist wasn't there at the time it recorded it so that she could be at home and go back in the recording to look at um the ecg and uh be able to let us know if there's something really weird. Granted, we were able to say, that doesn't look right, or I think that's what it is, um, but then she could confirm what it actually was. So these are just the ECG basics. So um, black and white, right, go in the front, um, and then the red and green goes in the back. So how I just remember it is that the red and the green, Christmas is on the end of the year, so um, that's how I remember it. Um, and then um, black and then white um, is like a newspaper, so it comes in the morning, so it's in the front of the day. Um, so white is on the right, so the right front leg. And then um, white is Christmas, I'm sorry, <laughs> white is so snow over grass, not the other one too. Um, so green is on the right rear. So that's another way too. There's so many different ways of remembering. Um, so just, you know, there's smoke over fire is another one as well. So um, you have black and then the fire is the red. So smoke over fire, the black is on your left and then the fire is on the left rear. So that's another way of remembering it. Um, also, another secret, too, is that on the leads, it does actually tell you where they go, but you should know exactly or find a way to remember it so that you know how to put them on quickly. So when we talk about leads, um, there are many different leads um, to slice, elect electrically slice up the heart um, so that we can get a picture of the heart electrically. 
So, um, you know, we have 10 lead um, ECGs, um, we have six lead ECGs. Uh, so it just kind of depends on um, where you work. Um, if you work with a cardiologist, you'll absolutely do 10 lead ECGs. Um, sometimes they'll ask for a six lead ECG. Um, you'll at least do a six lead ECG if you work at a cardiologist. But typically, if you're working at a general practice or um, even, you know, just an emergency clinic or something like that, you'll just do a lead to um, ECG. And the big reason for that is lead to, if you see here, it goes through, it, you can see the conductivity of the really big pieces of, um, you know, the heart. So the things that we want to look at are like the SA node. So it goes through the SA node, the right atrium, then the AV node, and then the left ventricle. So it goes through the big conductivity of the heart versus some of the other ones. I mean, obviously the other slices of the heart are important, but we want to see these big pieces of the heart of how it's conducting through the heart. So that's the big reason that we look at lead two. Now, if you look at how the ECG should look and like other leads, this is why it's important that when you are turning on your ECG, you are looking at what lead it's put on um, because sometimes it's gonna look weird. So if you are turning on your ECG and you are on lead one, your ECG is gonna look really weird. And so you're gonna be like, why does it look so weird? Always make sure you're on lead two, okay? So if you're on lead AVR, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with my animal while well, you're on the wrong lead. So make sure you always make sh on the, the right lead as well. All right, so uh, what does it diagnose? So what does our ECG actually do? Um, so it does um, diagnose cardiac arrhythmias, all right? Um, we are able to look at and see a heart rate um, any type of access deviation. So like this is our access here and can it actually um, diagnose like if something is below the access or not. Um, the cool thing is, is it can tell us as there's chamber enlargement. Sometimes we can even see if there or indicate if there is fluid within the heart, um, which is really kind of interesting. Um, if there's fluid in the heart, sometimes we'll be able to see hey, you know, these R waves are looking really weird. Um, and, you know, if they are not uniform, um, there might be fluid within the heart that's kind of muffling it. Um, so it gives us an idea of, okay, we need to take an ultrasound to this. And, you know, this is looking weird here. We need to take an ultrasound to this and actually take a look at it. And sure enough, there'll be fluid there. So it, it's a tool for us to actually be able to look at this and then utilize a different tool to be able to diagnose it for sure. Um, and conduction abnormalities. So we're able to look and say, hey, um, are we, is something going on within the heart that's not right? You know, like, is there a conduction abnormality um, that we might need to, you know, put a pacemaker in or something to that effect? Uh, now, is this an irregular rhythm? You know, we have this going in, we have two beats here, this prolong here, a beat here, and then two beats here. And I would say, yes, you know, we could have um, a sinus arrhythmia going on, um, which seems kind of weird, but more likely we have something going on where this could be like um, a third AV block. Um, that, that's kind of going on, which is something that we need to, to definitely um, take a look at right away. Um, so our paper speed that we have, um, and this is kind of interesting too. So most of our paper speeds that we run in veterinary medicine is run at 50 millimeters per second. Um, so if you watch any videos or anything like that in human medicine, it's gonna be a little bit different um, so their paper speed typically runs at about 25 millimeters per second. Um, we can run ours at 25 millimeters per second. Uh, so it just kind of depends, but we run ours at 50 millimeters per second. Um, a big reason for that is because our heart rates are faster <laughs> that we look at. Um, so, so ours are run at 50 uh, millimeters per second. 
Um, and and you can change this. There's a speed um, selection knob to change it. So um, our big choices are 50 millimeters per second and then 25 millimeters per second. You can even change it to 12.5 millimeters per second, but I don't recommend it because it's all going to be squashed together. Um, but there are typically the two two selections. So, um, so how the reason we have this is that way we can um, count our heart rate. So this is the a really old school method because right now we have all these awesome ECGs. Um, that count it for us, but sometimes we do need to count our heart rates as well, especially if we're doing um, big ECGs like a 10 lead ECG and stuff like that, um, and it's a printout and we, we must um, calculate our heart rate. It's not hard at all. Um, we just need to do it. So, um, so if your paper speed is 50 millimeters per second, um, then then this is kind of how you count it, right? So um, each box that we have here, so these little tiny boxes that we have, um, that is one millimeter um, wide, okay? So these little tiny boxes are one millimeter wide. And when you look at these boxes, you'll see that there's like a, a little bit more definition to these boxes, um, every five boxes across and five boxes down. So we know that in these five boxes here, then that's five millimeters, right? So we have five millimeters there. So then rather than counting 50 millimeters across, because that would take forever and we have to have really, really good eyes, um, because e even these little boxes right now that are blown up, that's that's really hard to count, right? Um, we can then look at these five across and say, okay, 50 millimeters per second. If we count the big boxes that are five across, we could then go 10 of these big boxes that have five in it would be 50 millimeters per second, right? So five big boxes with five across is equals 50 millimeters per second. So it would be 10 big boxes equals one second, right? So then if we had 25 millimeters per second, five of these big boxes, right? Because 25 divided by five is five five big boxes would equal the one second. So it makes it a little bit easier to count it across. So that's how we would be able to count or beginning to count our boxes across to start working on our heart rate. So um, we'll end up kind of being able to do that. So what we'll do, and I'm sorry that this is kind of hard to read. So we have our 10 big boxes or our five big boxes right, gives us one second across, right? And so just like you count heart rate um, when you are listening to a heart rate, you have to get 60 seconds, right? You have to get 60 seconds to get a minute. So when we get a strip of, of paper, we're not gonna have a whole minute's worth of paper. We'll probably have, you know, a couple seconds, maybe six seconds, but we'll only have a couple seconds worth that we'll be able to count. So say when you're counting up your boxes, you get, you know, two seconds, right? You have two seconds on the strip. You have to be able to divide to get your a multiplication factor. Just like when you are counting your heart rate, uh, for your animal, you're counting only, you're not counting 60 seconds worth, you're counting how many seconds you were taught in school. You're counting maybe, you know, 10 seconds and then you multiply by six to get 60 seconds. Or you're counting 15 seconds and then multiplying by four. It's the same concept. So you have two seconds on your strip and then two seconds or 60, you need 60 seconds, so you divide that by two, and then you have your multiplication factor of 30, right? So in the end, you need to have that 60. So 
you'll have that 30 seconds worth for your multiplication factor. So when we count our R waves, because our R waves are, are going to be our indicator of the beat, right? Um, once we get our R waves for those two seconds, we're going to need to multiply our multiplication factor in there to get a total of 60 seconds. So I'll be able to show you guys what that looks like. It's pretty simple. So what does our heart rate consist of? All right, so you guys, it was really important to know, so we don't have to get into like the segments and intervals and all of that, the J point, like that's not that big of a deal. What's important for you guys to know is what the P wave represents. So you have your P wave, right? What the P wave represents, what the QRS is and what it represents and what the T wave is and represents, right? And what that all looks like. So the P wave is here, all right? And what it represents is atrial depolarization, okay? So it is the atrial wave, all right? Your atrium is depolarizing. And so if there's something wrong with your P wave, it is something atrial, it is an atrial issue, all right? So that means anything ventricular is not an issue. It is only atrial. So we have cut out half of the issues, right? All right, so then your QRS complex is ventricular depolarization and then atrial repolarization is somewhere in here. It doesn't have like a beat, it's just, it's repolarizing somewhere in there. So any issues with the QRX complex is a ventricular issue, okay? Now, a VPC means that it is cutting the line of the P wave. So the, the P wave is gone and this the QRS is going, uh-uh, I am cutting you and you are gonna have to wait your turn somewhere else. And so a lot of times with VPC is, it is known for being wide and bizarre, okay? So that is one big thing. So it cuts in line. So again, the QRS is uh, ventricular depolarization and atrial repolarization. And then the T wave is ventricular repolarization. And a big thing with the T wave that you'll see is that if this is um, tall indented. This you see a lot in block cats. So you'll see um, with any animal that has hyperkalemia. Okay, so a high potassium. And when you see that in animals, um, we need to intervene right away because they can end up having big cardiac issues, have heart attack, heart attack like issue, and, and death, right? And so this was, is something that. Um, was a question for you guys last week um, of how to bring um, that hyperkalemia down. How, how can we bring that down? An adjunct, um, adjunct of therapy, um, which could be insulin, uh, dextrose, um, and calcium gluconate are big therapies that we utilize. Okay, obviously fluid therapy too. Um, but pulling that, that uh, uh, potassium out, I think, I, I don't know that I, I said hyperkalemia, but I think I just said that wrong earlier, <laughs> so early. Um, but, but bringing that potassium out of the body, it's a buildup of the potassium. I think I saw calcium earlier, um, but bringing that potassium out of the black cats or, or any animal that has the buildup of potassium. All right, so those tented T waves. Okay, so I've already given you obviously what, the, what it is, so sinus rhythm, okay? But this is a way that we can count their, um, th their heart rate. So let's say that this animal, uh, we're doing 25, um, millimeters per second. And so we can count 
um, the boxes. So it would be five boxes per second. So we have one, two, three, four, five. Then one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Um, so we would stop there. So we have three seconds worth, correct? Um, and so if we have three seconds worth, we need 60. So 60 divided by three would be our multiplication factor would be 20 then, because we need 60 in the end. Um, so then we count our R waves. So we have one, two, three, four, five. So we have five times 20 equals 100 beats per minute. So um, that's it, it's really not, not too bad. All right, so this is respiratory sinus arrhythmia. So respiratory sinus arrhythmia just shows that every time an animal takes a breath, there's just a change in the rhythm of that animal's ECG. So you have that beat here, they're taking a breath, there's like a little bit of a delay there, you get three beats, and then obviously they're taking a breath, there's that little extra delay there, three beats, extra delay there. So it's the same rhythm, it's just every time they take a breath, there's that extra beat. Atrial premature contraction is where that P wave is cutting the line of the T wave. So the T wave is right here. Um, and so you see how it, you know, is, is supposed to be, right? The T wave's there. The T wave was not quite finished yet. Um, and the atrium, the P wave, cut in line. I was like, nope, we're starting again. Um, and it looks a little funky too. So um, that's an atrial premature contraction. And here's ventricular premature contraction. So um, this one's a little bit of um, ventricular premature, like bigamy um, contractions because they're different. They're different looking. So these are VPCs too. They look different than this one. So um, just keep that in mind too. We have to kind of um, let people know like they don't all look the same, but these guys are wide and bizarre, right? They look wide and bizarre. There's no P wave. See here, this is a normal um, complex. There's a P wave there. Um, and then the T wave there. There's no P wave there. And there's like no official T wave. <laughs> Um, so this is truly a VPC. Now you can have um, QR, um, yeah, QRS complexes that go below the access here, okay? So don't say that that's a VPC. Um, that would be okay. Um, so there will be a, you know, a P wave there. So keep that in mind. You have to have no P wave, like the, this one cuts in line. Um, so supraventricular arrhythmias means supraventricular um, that are arrhythmias that occur above the ventricle, all right? So um, it could be a sinus bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. So these are like atrial issues, essentially. So um, you have our tachycardia. So we did um, our... our um, heart rate, so say it's a 25 millimeter per second. Um, so we do one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So I just did four seconds for fun. Um, so 60 divided by 4 is 15, right? And so I'm going to count the P waves. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I meant R waves, by the way. Um, so, sorry. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I think I said 8 times 15.
is 120. Um, so I'm sure this is probably a 50. <laughs> um, a 50 millimeters per second. So um, we could probably say that this is probably not sinus tachycardia right now for us, but if we did 50 millimeters per second, it might be sinus tachycardia. Um, atrial flutter is actually looks, oops. Sorry, let me get back to this. Atrial flutter looks like this down here. So people confuse atrial flutter with atrial fibrillation a lot. Um, fibrillation, and when you see um, fibrillation from uh, ventricular fibrillation, it should make a little bit more sense. Um, but fibrillation just looks like uh, it is a line that is a squiggly line, I should say. Um, and so atrial fibrillation just looks like P waves with this squiggly line, right? With that, um, or I'm sorry, um, QRS, QRS is with squiggly lines because it's an atrial issue. Um, and atrial flutter, um, it, it sounds like it should be pretty, but in all actuality, um, it sounds like tennis shoes in a dryer, so it doesn't sound good. And it looks like a horror show to me. Um, that sawtooth uh, marks, right? It looks like sawtooth marks here. Um, and so it's not like fluttering through space, okay? Um, so almost looks like if you want to think of bee buzzing through, um, it's like a sawtooth, right? This doesn't look like a bee buzzing. Um, maybe through a storm, you know, it's getting blown around. I don't know, but it's a sawtooth. It's not pretty. So just, just remember that it's not exactly what you think it should be. Sinus bradycardia is dogs that are below um, 60 beats per minute, cats that are um, below 70 to 80 beats per minute. I personally think anything in a cat that's below 100 would be probably uh, bradycardia, but it is really case by case. So keep that in mind. Um, sinus tachycardia should be actually, I need, I need to change this to dogs that are above 180 beats per minute and cats that are above anything um, 240 beats per minute. Again, this is another atrial flutter, okay? So the atrium is just not repolarizing correctly. And this is atrial fibrillation. So this is why people think it's flutter, but it's really fibrillation. And ventricular tachycardia, so it has to be four or more of those widened Fassar VPCs, and it also has to be tachycardic, so that over 180 beats per minute, okay? And so what happens is, is these animals go into ventricular tachycardia um, where, you know, they look like this, they become ventricular fibrillation right after that if we don't intervene. Um, and if we don't get them um, from ventricular fibrillation where we intervene with, uh, you know, using defibrillator and drugs, they will go into a systole. And we all know with a systole, um, if we don't obviously intervene, um, we don't have any chance of bringing them back. So that's not good. For perfusion parameters, we have to look at our CRT, our mucous membrane. So what color those would be? Um, hopefully we have pink, normal uh, mucous membrane. Um, if they're pale, obviously it could be that they're anemic or they have poor perfusion. So how are we going to fix that, obviously? So checking um, our patient's PCV is number one. Um, if they're pale um, and their you know, PCV is um, normal um, or even high, um, what can we 
do at that point. So are we going to give them um, food therapy? We are bolusing them. Um, are we going to then see, hey, look at their cold. Um, how, how can we warm them up? at that point. Um, so these are important things. Um, when I was in tech school, I had a patient who um, had an intussusception. So it was my, my animal um, that I was taking care of in school. And so uh, we came in and she actually had collapsed um, rectum and ankle. And um, so she had, uh, obviously was in shock and, and all of that. And so we had to take her to surgery. And so I was scrubbed in um, and uh, throughout surgery, she, I guess she was really pale. Um, and then she came out of surgery. And so when I looked at her, she was super pale. And um, it, it was just really weird. Um, one of our uh, CBT, um, I guess, teachers, you would say, um, she was like, yeah, she was like that throughout surgery and, and everything. And, um, you know, uh, the means that we had at the time in school were very limited. Obviously, this is about 15 years ago and so um we they they didn't really have much that we could do and I said should we at least check a PCV so we checked a PCV and her um PCV was 15 percent um and so um you know I knew from working emergency that the first thing to start bleeding in that case especially being in shock is the GI system and granted she had a GI issues for that, you know, and, and everything. So um, they weren't going to do um, blood transfusion and everything. And granted, we could have um, tried as much as we possibly could and see if she progressed and, and gotten better and just regenerated and, and everything as well, um, which may have worked. But um, She's also was extremely dehydrated. So, you know, rehydrating her PCV would have um, probably not gone down and she wasn't really waking up from, from surgery very well. So, um, but these are things that obviously we need to monitor while we're in surgery so we can intervene as soon as possible. So, um, so yeah, um, being blue, cyanotic, um, any type of cyanosis that you can see is really important. Um, red being toxemic um, or hyperthermic. Um, this is incredibly important. We see a lot, especially in summertime um, when animals are having heat stroke issues and, and stuff like that. Um, yellow being icteric um, and brown, especially this is important for Tylenol toxicity um, that you may see. So methoglobinemia is, is important terminology to you. Um, and then pulse quality as well. So, um, you know, what, what does their pulse feel like? Is it sweaty? Is it bounding? Is it, um, you know, weak? Stuff like that. Um, and their blood pressure. Blood pressure is so important to note. Um, we need to be checking blood pressures at this time, especially now in surgery-related uh, procedures, you know. Um, we might not have had the capability a long time ago, but it is really important now to be doing all of these monitoring parameters. Um, and so what does CRT stand for, right? Um, these are things we learned right away when we were um, in school, uh, probably in your first year, you know, so capillary recall time, um, normal is less than two seconds. So if it's greater than two seconds, what does that mean? So dehydration, vasoconstriction, are they shocky, excessive anesthetic depth? Um, are they hypotensive, um, hypothermic? Okay, so um, as you guys get to know me, I am really, really big on temperatures. Um, and not checking temperatures is um, not an excuse for anything, even just regular, you know, appointments coming in for, for their wellness checks. Like um, they now have, uh, um, I don't want to call them Avid Chips because that's a brand, but um, microchips that can check temperature. So if your clinic um, wants to do like a fear-free or low stress handling and not check temperatures, um, making sure that you guys are now offering those microchips that check temperatures then so that you can make sure to do a full physical exam that includes um, temperature checking. Um, cardiac failure. 
of law could be an indication of um, your CRP having being prolonged. Um, one second or less is also in that means. So evaluating fluid rate for the last time, listening to your patient's lung and heart, that is really, really important. Why? What, what could be going on, right? If your ERCRT is less than one second, um, obviously they could be fluid overloaded um, or anything to that effect. Like over perfusion is not, is, is also not normal. So here are some obviously um, different colors of mucous membrane um, that we should take a peek at. So the top one over here is showing sinusis, right? Um, the gums don't have to be completely blue. You can have the tongue be blue. You can have a little sinusis here. The stuff that we have to take a look at. Um, we could have parasympathetic as well. Um, also, here's an icterus, right? Pale mucous membrane. Um, obviously, this is a horse. <laughs> Um, here we have fatigia, which is really, really important to note. Um, and then here is your brown mucous membrane. So your Tylenol toxicity or methagolinemia. Um, brown mucous membranes are important because what happens with the Tylenol toxicity is that Tylenol actually blocks um, the oxygen from getting off of the hemoglobin. And so what happens is, is that that oxygen dies on the hemoglobin and that's why it turns brown. And so you're just getting that coloring on um, from off of that those hemoglobin. Um, and that's why your mucous membranes are turning brown at that point. Um, and your patients are completely oxygen dependent at that point. So they need oxygen right away, regardless of them turning blue or anything like that, they are still oxygen dependent um, because the oxygen is not viable and it can't get to the tissue anyway. Um, so pulse bodies so palpate those art that artery um, and also scalp the animal, right? So the reason why, obviously we're looking for pulse de uh, deficits. So um, obviously we want it to be strong, but um, give an idea, it gives us an idea of the blood pressure, right? So we can kind of tell what the blood pressure is gonna be like. Um, and we have to know how to feel the pulse in different areas of the body. So the femoral pulse, we can't just be like, oh, I can only feel the pulse in the femoral area. No, we should be able to feel the pulse in all different areas. So femoral pulse, dorsal pedal, the lingual, um, carotid, or facial, obviously, and horses and stuff like that. We can't always feel facial in every animal, but sometimes the lingual pulse. So lingual pulse, I normally feel back here, um, but you should be able to feel it all up and down the, the tongue there. Obviously, don't do that in um, awake animals. So blood pressure here is kind of your normal blood pressure. Um, and your MAP, it should be the cautionary is 60 millimeters per mercury, um, or 50 millimeters of mercury is our caution. Um, and it gives us an idea of the perfusion to the rest of the body. Here, here's the MAP uh, um, actual formula. It doesn't mean it's the mean of like, you know, both of these um, combined together, but this is the actual formula itself. So how do we keep our blood pressure, you know, at a good level? We need to keep our patients lighter, um, not meaning that they're awake or, or anything to that effect, but we have the means to use our anesthetic agents to keep our patients at as light as possible, right? So utilizing vocal blocks, utilizing um, different medications so that we can keep our patients at a lighter gas level and stuff like that. Keeping our patients as warm as possible. Um, our our um, normal temperature for our patients under anesthesia should be their normal temperature while they're awake. It shouldn't, we shouldn't strive to keep them at 98 degrees, we should strive to keep them at 100 degrees or or higher, you know, um, and we can do that in surgery um, if we have the appropriate warming devices. Um, supplement um, IV fluids, right? So they should all be receiving crystalloids under anesthesia, every single patient, including, you know, neuters or, or cat neuters um, of some sort. Um, 
if you know yeah, putting them on IV fluids prior to your surgery if needed. Um, if they need colloids even um, for that surgery, then do that as well, you know, depending on the surgery. Um, maintaining acid base balance and electrolytes, checking those if needed, like that is really important. And maintain that normal ventilation um, by giving breaths as needed, giving a breath to them every five minutes to prevent anaphylaxis, which is important. And then of course, giving a presser when needed. Um, as long as you maintain the blood pressure and maintain everything else, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that even in my worst case patients in emergency and critical care, I mean, um, under anesthesia, I should say, I don't think I ever had to give them dopamine during a surgery um, because we maintain them so well on anesthetic agents um, and, and stabilize them prior to surgery. Now, I've had animals in the ICU we've had on dopamine, um, but nothing in a surgical case because we did a good job of stabilizing them and all of that. Um, but there are so many things in between here that we did to get their blood pressure up. Um, so really think about that before. And I'm not saying I don't condone these pressers, but there's so many things that you can do prior to giving a basal presser that you just have to think through before you do it. There are a lot of people that skip these steps and just go to a basal presser when truly, um, you know, that these things can save their life um, so much more. You know, just warming your patient can keep them um, in recovery alive. You know, um, more than a presser really can. Um, it wakes them up faster and it keeps them alive so much faster too um, in that case, you know, um, because there's no reason that a patient should have to wake up at 93 degrees, you know, when they were just spayed. That's, that's just absolutely crazy. Um, so shock and blood loss. So, I mean, this is just one thing that we had to learn. And I think it's just, it's a, it's a good concept just to keep in mind. Um, but every three by three gauze square is about five to six mils of blood loss. So keeping in mind like how much blood is actually being lost in a patient is good. Um, a healthy animal can tolerate, they say about 15% blood loss. It actually is somewhere between 15 to 20% blood loss. Um, this is actually also really low. Um, it says 13 mils per kg in dogs and cats. Um, I think this is from McKinnon's too um, at one point. If you think about this and you did the math, um, this is actually lower than what we have our animals donate blood. Um, and I know I talked about this even when I was teaching at class too. Um, when you do the math and when you even see some other people speak about it to you that, that deal with transfusion medicine, their donation is about 20 mils per kg. Um, so I do like to give them, I'm going to read a lot of different things as well when you go out in practice and everything. So I always say, um, keep it in mind somewhere in between um, this and then your 20 mils per, per kid um, because, uh, you know, don't, they're never going to take more than the donation blood, obviously. So, um, yeah, I think they're a little bit under of what they're, what they're thinking. So, um, so something to also consider. So hypertension um, is another thing too that we can also see. So like they could be too light um, in anesthesia and also pain. Um, sometimes we don't think that animals are going to have as pain as, as what we anticipated. So um, when we give other pre meds too early and then the pre meds wear off. Um, so just think on that level that you know, okay, we have them on the um, inhalant really, really high, and they're still waking up. Maybe we need to give them some more pre meds, or maybe we can give a local block, or maybe we can do something else that's going to help them, or maybe we can put them on a CLI. Maybe we can do something else that is going to help them 
um, that that's just not working, you know, currently. So just keep that in mind. Um, they could have some renal disease too, so the underlying condition that we just didn't know. Um, so that's why it's a really good idea to do the same blood test. If an um, you don't want to do that, you know, um, you never know that young dogs can have renal disease as well, and you just don't know. Hypercapnia is an osteoclast hypertension, so that's why it's really important to um, check in with that condition before you start surgery. Um, our uh, um, cell line can only um, be used for a maximum of eight hours of use at a time. Um, after that, that cell line is, um, has absorbed um, all of the uh, uh, carbon dioxide that it can. And so we have to change it out after time. So you can't just be like, oh, you know, we change it every month or we change it every week, um, which maybe, you know, within a week's time, you've only done, you know, eight hours of surgery and that's good. But there are places that, you know, do surgery eight hours a day. Um, and so what's happening is that animal is um, taking back all of this um, uh, carbon dioxide from the animals that have pre previously been in surgery because there's too much carbon dioxide. So it's in tidal carbon dioxide level is high. And, and that's not fair. What you're doing at that point is suffocating the animal to death. And that's a way that we essentially can euthanize animals. Um, so uh, we have to be really careful when it comes to that, is that we have to change out the soda line pretty regularly. Um, hypoxia is also another thing. Pyrexia, um, acidosis, secondary um, to intracranial pressure, right? So one thing is called Cushing's reflex. Um, so Cushing's reflex is when you have a high blood pressure and, and you have a low heart rate. So this is due a lot of times to if you have head trauma. So let's say a hit by car or something to that effect. And so you'll have um, your high blood pressure and your low heart rate. So what we'll have to do is give um, mannitol or sometimes we'll even do um, a hypertonic saline or what we call turbo starch too. So we'll do a hypertonic saline um, and even some sort of um, synthetic colloid. So head of starch or bed of starch um, to try to pull out any type of um, fluid that's not sitting on the brain um, or just that swelling that's on the brain. And um, it will kind of even out that Cushing's reflex. So um, bringing up that heart rate and lowering that blood pressure. So just remember Cushing's reflex. It's not Cushing's disease, but Cushing's reflex. Um, so drugs also can cause hypertension. So ketamine, um, anticholinergics, and epinephrine, right? Um, so if you want to say you have hypotension, if you need to bring up the blood pressure, Remember, we can add a anticholinergic and um, that will increase your heart rate and your blood pressure. So um, some treatments that we can utilize are beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and uh, nitric oxide um, to treat that hypertension. Oh, just went too far back. Sorry about that. There we go. So another thing um, is our Doppler blood pressure. So how do we check our blood pressure is an indirect way. So um, putting our crystal 
um, from the probe on. Um, and so we detect that sound wave and um, that probe is actually placed on the artery. Um, and then we place the, the cuff on the leg. So whether it's below or above the carpus or the tail. So there is a specific spot that we need to place our, our cuff. So um, this is actually has been determined by the ACVIM. Um, and so what has been decided is that for larger dogs, um, the cuff is placed above the carpus of tarsus, okay? And the cuff is measured um, as 40% the circumference of the leg. Um, and for smaller animals, so smaller dogs, cats, we place the cuff below the carpus or tarsus, and we measure 30% of the circumference of the leg um, or the tail uh, and um, place it there, okay? Um, so that is the now uh, directions that they have given us. Now, ACFAM, um, they have said, yes, we, we want you to take serial blood pressures and um, ideally take seven of them um, throughout the first two um, because they can be a little bit weird at times. And then you have five. Um, so, you know, take as many as you can. You could take five. Um, you might have to throw out a couple of them and then, you know, average out three. Um, so just kind of depends um, on what your hospital decides. But what's really important is that you uh, utilize how you measure it. You should always um, have your patient lying down. You should utilize the leg that is facing up, um, just like in the picture here. And you should also write down on your chart which leg you used, how your patient was laying, um, where you placed your cuff exactly, um, the size cuff you used, and or the tail, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so however you did your blood pressure so that the next person who comes along can repeat the blood pressure the exact same way the next time. The idea behind it is so that the blood pressure is taken the next time exactly the same way uh, so that there is, so you can do this on a trend, right? We don't want to change anything up so we know exactly um, how we can repeat it and we can notice that trend over time. Because if we change anything, um, there's a lot of variables. So I know this picture is really weird because I just told you, oh, you put the cuff below um, the carpus and, and I'm right, <laughs> it's weird. So this, this obviously would be, and plus this person is stressing out the cat. You know, we should have this cat um, try to look lay relaxed, right? Um, because this cat does not look relaxed and we're probably not gonna get a great reading. That's why I really like on cats that we can utilize the tail a little bit more because they care slightly less. Um, a lot of times too, if you place a cat like with a blanket over them or something like that, they do tend to be a little slightly more relaxed as well, um, rather than you sitting them up and holding them straight still. Um, but you know, whatever. Um, so we, Osteometric um, is nice um, because we're able to measure the systolic, diastolic, and MAP. They have new ones out here now, like this one, that are a lot more consistent than like the Surgivet and, and stuff. Um, Surgivet even has said to us that um, it isn't very reliable for smaller patients. Um, so, um, but they do have nice ones out now that are a little bit more accurate. So the Doppler is really great for the smaller patients, but like I said, you want to try to get at least three to five readings. Um, you don't have to obviously get your seven readings unless you're an internal medicine person and really want to. Um, but try to get at least three to five readings um, before you, you average them out. Um, central venous pressure um, is a really, it, 
it's kind of phasing out, but some people are still using it in the ICU. Um, but we're utilizing it with a manometer. Um, you need to have a central line in, um, which is kind of shown here. Um, so you place your central line and it's measured to the right atrium of the heart, um, which we then um, verify it on a radiograph. Um, so you know exactly where it's placed. Um, and then it is, again, based on trends. So the normal is somewhere between zero to five centimeters of water. Some people say zero to 10 centimeters of water. Um, depends which book you read. <laughs> um, it's an indirect blood pressure again. Okay, so direct blood pressure would be um, um, and uh, gosh, um, an, a direct um, artery, artic whatever, blood pressure. Um, but this is still indirect, okay? Um, and so you place this and then what you're gonna do is hook it up um, to your fluids and then you have fluids that run up here. Um, and so what it does is it measures the fluid that is going um, down this manometer into that vessel and it's pushing back onto the vessel to say, okay, how much pressure is gonna equal equalize into that vessel. And once it hits there, once it hits to where it's equalizing, that's um, the pressure um, that's there. So it's floating um, and it marks that area. Um, you can make one of these manometers as well. Um, I've made a ton of them over the years until they had commercialized ones. Um, and it's really easy to make, um, but Granted, it is based on trends because you don't always hit the same spot in every single animal. So, and every animal is different, but it's a good way to know like how um, the hemodynamics of each patient. So, All right, so ventilation. So our respiratory rate, right, in animals, um, it's, I, I gave a broad one because everyone's is a little bit different. Um, so when patients are awake, right, so our, our animals are breathing somewhere between 10 to 30 breaths a minute in dogs and cats, 24 to 40 breaths per minute. But when they're anesthetized, it's somewhere between eight to 24 breaths while they're anesthetized, usually it's pretty low, right? Um, so we have to keep that in mind. Um, and, and that's why we do um, give them breaths while they're under anesthesia because we really want to exercise their alveoli. Um, so we have to monitor them for any type of hypoventilating or even hyperventilating. Um, and there's many reasons why that can happen, right? So um, we'll obviously talk a little bit about that. So. Um, hypoventilating can occur because they're obviously in a deeper plane of anesthesia. Um, and it also decreases their tidal volume by a lot. So it causes that atelectasis if we don't um, give them IPVVs every five minutes, so intermittent positive pressure ventilation. Um, this can cause respiratory arrest. Um, and obviously with that, that can go into cardiac arrest. Um, hyperventilation. Um, increases their cardiac output. Um, it, it doesn't have an, uh, an adequate amount of removal of CO2. Um, it can make them become metabolic acidosis and um, give them pulmonary edema. Um, they could have just mild uh, surgical stimulus because of the hyperventilating. Like they could be slightly awake and feeling pain. So that's where we might need to intervene. Um, they could be progressing from moderate um, to, from, um, I'm sorry, light anesthesia to, to moderate anesthesia, or I'm sorry, moderate anesthesia to light anesthesia. So um, they could just be waking up. Hyperventilation does happen um, many times in obese animals. Um, and so this is a risk um, that we have um, when we do have animals that are overweight, um, there's a lot of times 
in uh, specialty surgery where they have these conversations with owners prior to going to surgery, um, especially like orthopedics and stuff too, um, not just because of the orthopedic failing or anything like that, but due to the uh, risk of anesthesia and, and just breathing under anesthesia as well. Um, and I obviously this is a risk uh, for inhuman medicine as well. Um, and, and we have a lot of obesity in our animals regardless. So um, this should be a conversation that we have with animals going under anesthesia for any reason, you know, uh, dentistry as well. Um, dentistry is becoming more and more popular, um, which thank goodness, um, but our dentistry procedures are taking even longer. And so um, th this is something that we should make sure that we are talking to our owners at every um, wellness visit um, for prevention of obesity um, and so that we can make sure that we don't have to have these risks going into any type of anesthetic event. Um, so difficulty breathing, so dips, yeah. Um, checking that there's adequate um, fresh gas flow. So, um, you know, before going to surgery, knowing that you are gonna have enough oxygen, right? Um, these should be the checkoffs before you start any anesthetic procedure is just making sure, hey, my anesthetic machine is ready to go, um, that you have oxygen supply. So for however long, don't, don't get into a procedure and then having to quickly figure out how to change your oxygen. That is, that is not okay for your animal. Um, and, and, you know, that, that would be really, really awful. Um, your ET tube um, is obstructed um, and you have to crack the placement. I mean, it happens once in a while, but making sure that you are um, prepared for anything that happens. Um, the pop-up valve is closed, um, stuff like that. Um, that's also another reason too, to make sure that you have that checked off prior to starting. Um, if I had a student who had the pop-up valve closed um, prior to starting, they, they would not be um, they would not be helping out uh, for surgery for for a little bit. I would have to have them I would have <laughs> I would have to think about, Think about that for for a little bit. Um, same thing with ad, adequate gas flow. Um, that that would be day one, first thing that that you everyone would be learning. So, I mean, that is a huge safety concern. Um, and so, yeah, um, if oxygen is too flow, we just uh, I'm sorry, low. We have to increase that flow gas. So, um, uh. You know, just just making sure that we know where our parameters are supposed to be at. You know, we have, um, you know, low flow and then a high flow. Um, like I said earlier, replacing the tank if we if we need it, but that that should have been done prior to. Um, and then if uh, ET tube is clogged, replace it, which we can we talked about already. Um, if reservoir bag is too full, um, confirming that pop-off valve is open, squeeze the bag to reduce the pressure. So, um, you know, there always should be gas in there, um, but sometimes it gets over full because our patient isn't necessarily taking it in all of that, um, the gas. If that's the case too, we also need to double check our um, oxygen Low then as well. If they're not taking in all of that gas, they may not need all of it too. So um, turn down the oxygen flow rate if needed. And then always listen to the lung sounds too. Make sure everything um, sounds okay. Um, blood gases. So this is really important um, to also know and kind of have a grasp on. So the normal pH of blood is um, 7.35 to 7.45. Um, and so, you know, knowing that 7.35 and under um, so if we go to 7.2, that would be acidotic. Our blood would be acidotic. Um, 7.45 and over, so 7.5 would be alkalotic. All right, so 7.46 would be um, alkalotic. Um, if we look then at our um, bicarb, so 7, I'm sorry, if we look at our bicarb, so HCO3, the normal is 22 to 26. 
Okay, so anything outside of that range would be abnormal. All right, now um, our carbon dioxide values are 35 to 45, which makes it really easy to remember because remember our pH of blood is 7.35 to 7.45. So um, 35 to 45, 7.35, 7.45, so just remember that. Now, the really interesting thing is, is that um, metabolic and um, so if your if your metabolic and your if I'm sorry if the pH and your bicarb matches so metabolic matches right the metabolic and the pH match right um that means that it's metabolic okay so um meaning that if it is You look at the CO2 value. So if you look at the pH first, you see that the pH is at first abnormal, right? So you find that the pH is low, so it's going toward the acidotic range, okay? So if you look at the, at the pH and it's the acidotic range, and next you're gonna look and see which one is abnormal, right? So you find that the abnormal one here is your um, CO2, okay? So you see that your CO2 is abnormal, and your CO2 is showing that it is abnormal and you know that it's going to be um, a respiratory issue, okay? So it's acidotic and it's going um, opposite, right? So you know that it is a respiratory acidosis, all right? Um, and obviously you know that CO2 comes from the lungs, right? Um, now, the metabolic comes from the kidneys. So bicarb comes from the kidneys, okay? Now, if you notice that your pH is elevated, right? Um, so say that it is a 7.45 or 7.47, okay? So it's elevated. You will know that, all right, um, this is alkalosis, right? So you look at your numbers and you figure out, okay, this is my my uh, carbon dioxide is um, the one that's abnormal here, all right? And so it has to be respiratory, all right? So we then determine it's a respiratory alkalosis. Now, it doesn't really matter in the beginning when you guys are first learning it, whether you guys know that, okay, um, the carbon dioxide aspect of it is reversed as respiratory, all right? That doesn't matter until we start talking about compensation, okay? Because sometimes you're gonna find out that both of these are abnormal, all right? For the time's sake, um, I teach you guys that which one is the winner, essentially. So the abnormal one is the winner. That's how I teach you guys. <laughs> so um, essentially, if I give you guys numbers, right? I say, all right, you guys get to tell me which one out of here is, you know, abnormal. So you have 7.35 to 7.45. Um, if it's going acidotic range or alkalotic, you get to choose. Um, 
which one of the CO2 or the HCO3 is abnormal. And the abnormal one is the winner. And the abnormal one, right, out of here, becomes the metabolic acidosis, alkalosis or whatever. Um, and then you guys choose. Um, and then from there, once you guys get that, we can then talk about, you know, uh, okay, if they're matching, if they're opposite, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into compensation later. So we'll do a few at some point um, and, and go from there and you'll understand. But for now, it's like, okay, I have a 7.25, which would be acidosis, right? Um, my HCO3 is 18 and my CO2 is 37. Which one would it be? We would choose HCO3 being 18 would be the abnormal one, right? So the abnormal one would be metabolic and that one would be the winner there. So that's how you, how you guys would figure it out from there. And, and so that starts our blood gas conversation. Um, so you guys start getting comfortable with that. That was long story short, it was super long. <laughs> I usually don't take that long to explain it. Um, I was trying to figure out if I wanted to go into compensation or not, but it's, it's too much <laughs> at once. Um, so pulse ox. So um, pulse ox and I are not true friends um, because there are a lot of people that rely on pulse ox. Um, and it's not something that we can completely rely on um, because of so many issues. So um, it's not the best indicator of how we can have a stable patient, right? So our normal pulse ox is somewhere above 95%, but our patient will still be hypoxic based on so many other factors. And the, the reason for that is, is that it, it only measures how much oxygen is on our hemoglobin, but doesn't measure how much oxygen is actually getting to the tissue itself, right? And so it's great that our oxygen is on the hemoglobin, but, but in order to survive, we need our patient to actually be oxygenated to the tissue of, of the entire animal. So it's great. It's an inexpensive tool. It's not invasive. Um, it, we just put it on our mucous membrane, right? But it doesn't necessarily indicate um, too much to us other than the patient's being oxygenated. Um, and so there's so many factors that can change this. So we have this being done to our patients in anesthesia. And so the biggest thing is that we, we don't keep our patient's temperature very warm during anesthesia, right? Many times I've seen patients coming out of surgery and their, their temperature is like 96 degrees, or I've seen it low, as low as 93 degrees. So the, the biggest thing is that Oxygen is so afraid of being cold, uh, and 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 they so they they hug on to um, hemoglobin and, and they don't want to leave, and so it it doesn't jump off of the hemoglobin to actually oxygenate the tissue, and so that's where our patients become more hypoxic. Um, so it's it's not the best indication of pulse ox symmetry. Um, or, or how, how well, how stable our patient really is. Um, so a better way that we can actually measure our patient and how, how well they're actually, not necessarily being oxygenated, but how well they're actually breathing um, is measuring their inspiration and expiration. Um, inspiration, right? It, their capnography should be zero millimeters of mercury, right? We, like, we shouldn't actually be gaining carbon dioxide while they're inspiring that would be like okay where are they getting that from right um because they should be breathing in oxygen 
and then expiring out they should be expiring out somewhere between 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury now sometimes it's going to be a little bit more elevated because some animals just um take a little bit longer than others right um i've learned from a friend that like i know you guys probably won't be working a ton with seals and stuff like that but they have a dive response and so over time and before they knew better um they were making the seals try to breathe uh, expiratory lives somewhere between 35 to 45 and they were noticing and i don't know how long ago this was they were noticing all these seals were dying and like why why is this happening like all these seals keep dying um and the reason was is because they have a dive response and so um they have to have their capnography their expiratory capnography be somewhere in the 60s um, of millimeters per mercury rather than 35 to 45 um and so it, it's been interesting because um it's kind of these teachable moment type of things where we have to learn this stuff in veterinary medicine because all of these different species are so different. Um, so these these are kind of guidelines that we go by. Um, so not every animal is the same, but we, we do have to have a kind of a guideline uh, uh, with some, some of these animals. So keep that in mind. So we have to, two different methods. So um, we have a mean stream that's connected to the ET tube. And then we also have a side stream that's just a small side um, tube that's um, on the sample side of the ET tube. Now, hypocapnia um, is just an overzealous artificial ventilation, it just means that we've increased the respiratory rate. They could be just too light of the anesthesia, as painful, really, um, or they're hypoxic. Um, hypercapnia is that they're hypoventilating. They have decreased respiratory rate, um, and they also could have a decreased like minute volume. Um, we do that sometimes when we are waking them up um, at, or they're on a ventilator. Um, so we do that on purpose so that we're trying to stimulate them to breathe. Um, so it's for a very short period of time um, to kind of get them to breathe. Sometimes if they still won't, we'll have to turn them back up on the ventilator, but we're trying to get them to breathe. So it's like catching their brain to be like, oh my gosh, I'm not breathing, I'm not breathing, I'm not breathing. I need to take a breath on my own. Um, but if they don't, we have to give them a breath. Um, hypercapnia can also be an exhausted soda line. So like what we talked about earlier, um, also a kinked ET tube. So um, that they're actually not able to, uh, we're not actually able to get them to breathe out the air itself or malfunctioning unidirectional you know, valves on the anesthesia you know, machine. This is something is like sticking. So we need to get that fixed as well, which on our anesthesia you know, machine, we have to get serviced um, at, you know, at least every year um, where those need to get cleaned out quite a bit, even though they are um, covered on the anesthesia you know, machine, they still get a bunch of dust and grossness on them too. So. Um, this is just a quote I put in here. Oh God, a while back. <laughs> so we were having, it was probably my first term that I taught um, at a um, college. And I remember the morale was pretty pretty low. Um, and I remember putting that quote um, just as a pick me up um, for them. So, um, so yeah, I just left it in there. Um, so thermoregulation, so again, one of my favorite things to do. So that's our most complicated um, thing that we see. Um, they can lose, uh, you know, three degrees or more. So taking a rectal down 35 minutes, you can also do an esophageal temp. Um, I've also done temps through um, their nose even. <laughs> um, so kind of doing like a nasal, um, almost like a, oh my goodness, uh, nasal, um, like not nasal oxygen line kind of treatment, uh, not treatment, but um, with their thermometer kind of thing. Um, and it's worked um, in cases like that if I had to. So, um, but yeah, any way to take their temperature, we've done. So 
Um, the treatments for that is like bear hugger, IV fluid warmer, um, uh, warm water blanket. Um, some things that we don't necessarily recommend, but people have done. So like heated rice. Um, I really like bubble wrap. Um, people do socks. Um, bubble wrap works really, really well. Um, no, don't use an electric heating pad. Um, you just can't regulate it. It does burn the patients um, as well. Um, bear huggers are really nice. There's all different types of bear huggers out there um, that you can use. Make sure you check your reflexes and then knowing when they're lost. So gag reflex so happens in late stage two. Pedal is early stage three. Um, and um, palpebral is in stage 3.2. Corneal, obviously, you don't want to lose. Your eye position. So the biggest eye position that we should know, obviously, is stage 3.2, so ventral medial. Um, gag, obviously, is really lost um, in stage 3.1. That's when we should be intubating, right? Pedal um, should be gone by stage 3.2 is when we would be doing surgery. And palpebral um, is somewhere in stage 3.2 for most animals. Some lose it in stage 3.3, which is kind of depends. So, and then records, obviously records aren't any legal document. Be be thorough with your documents. If it's not written down, it didn't happen. So recording vitals every five minutes, and it's really important that post-op vitals need to be written um, as well. Um, record all drugs given, even emergency drugs. Um, the drug name, concentration, mill milligrams and mix, the route and location, um, the time and who gave it. Um, and then recovery. So when the surgeon is closing, start turning down the anesthetic. Um, you know, like start start preparing to wake them up. Um, and when they're off of anesthesia, like I'm sorry, maintain on oxygen while the anesthetic is off for about five to ten minutes while they're recovering. Um, start stimulating them, but don't like shake them like crazy. So who wants to wake up like that, right? Um, and then they will go through all of the stages, but in reverse. So remember that when you were putting them under anesthesia, they had a crazy stage two, they're gonna have a crazy stage two coming back. Um, so they're more prone to have self-trauma or biting at that time, especially if they had a crazy stage two. So that's why it's really important to keep their um, fear and stress down. Um, throughout the day um, before surgery, right? Um, warm the patient to 100 degrees before removing like an IV catheter, stuff like that. And then wait until the patient swallows at least twice, then deflate your cuff and remove their ET tube. Um, don't leave them unattended. Please don't leave them unattended until they're extubated and don't leave them unattended on a table. Um, they could bite the tube. Um, they can fall off the table. I've actually seen it where a patient was under anesthesia and woke up enough to where um, it was a dachshund to, to where it rolled off the table and fell off the table. Um, so wait until, you know, you could take, um, sorry, continue to monitor the patient every 10 minutes until the vitals are pretty normal. Um, you don't have to attempt them every 10 minutes, but just monitor them pretty well. Um, and then remember to give the post op pain meds, chart everything that you're doing, remove the pools and whatever you have to stuff out of the cage because they're going to be dysphoric and everything. Um, and again, don't leave them unattended on a table. Don't leave an animal unattended on a table ever um, because you just never know. Um, complications um, you can have aspiration, chewing licking, removal of sutures, hemorrhage, cover burn, burns in general. Um, and it's just bad, it's really bad things. Um, and here's just a, um, sorry, a really bad aspiration um, dog uh, that happened. Um, it was a dog that vomited and aspirated. 
Um, so you can see how the aspiration in this photo here. Um, so yeah, it's really, really bad. That's his heart right there, obviously. But here's all that aspiration. And it was just a puppy. So not good. Awesome. So we are done with our anesthesia lectures. So thank you guys so much. I hope you learned a bunch about anesthesia and I will see you all soon. Thanks again.